Hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon, or if you're in certain time zones, uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to this week's session um, of our Accounting Fly webinar series. So glad you could make it with us. Uh, today we have a, a terrific topic around certifications. So uh, I really expect uh, some, some just very interesting and, and possibly eye-opening information here. But hopefully it will be extremely valuable for you. And again, we're just excited that you've joined us. Um, I'm Deanna Laird, and I'm the Director of uh, University Relationships um, for Accounting Fly. So some of you, I think, have joined us before, and I'm so glad to have you back. And some of you are new. Um, for those that are new, I just you know, wanted to let you know that we have these webinars weekly and different topics each week. So uh, hopefully this will be a nice introduction for you on what we're offering here, all with the intent of, of giving a variety of you know, information that will um, hopefully guide you and, and, and be valuable for you as you are developing um, either early in your accounting career or even a few years into your accounting careers, possibly making some decisions about which direction you want to go. Um, we just hope that you know, we're helping to make you well informed of all your uh, various options. Um, so that you can make the best decision on, on what's right for you. Um, so again, you know, we at Accounting Fly, this is really um, important important for us, and um, hopefully it's really valuable valuable to you. As a part of being here with us, um, you will receive a link of this recording. We are recording, and um, at the end of the of the session. We'll um, get the recording kind of set, and in a couple of days, hopefully, we'll be able to get the link sent out to you. And just so you know, I mean, I know you all that are hear me right now are, um, have been able to join this, this webinar, um, but just if you're interested in other webinars, if you register, and even if you're not able to attend, we will send out links of those recordings as well. So just so you know the way that this works. Um, once you register for a webinar, we'll get the information to you, even if you can't be here directly with us. Uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end of this, um, well, towards the end of the session. And um, depending on the number of questions, sometimes we're able to address all the questions. Sometimes we just run out of time. If that's the case, um, we will make sure that we um, get your, your questions answered and sent back out to you, okay? So I really encourage all of you to uh, ask questions throughout the session. Um, we'll probably hold most of them till the end of the session, if not all, but, but I will be collecting all the questions and, and try to get um, those answered as much as possible during today's hour. If not, then like I said, we'll send them out later. So don't hold back on your questions. We want to hear what's on your mind and make sure that this information um, it's resonating and, and clear, clear for you. Okay, and I guess one other thing I'd, I'd mention, um, you know, if if you have questions about the just this registration for this webinar series on an ongoing basis, you can shoot that question to me. Um, if you have questions about accounting fly, and, and if you haven't haven't signed up there, I'd encourage you to take a look um, because that's where our job board is, and, and you can look at the variety of of um, job opportunities there on accountingfly.com. So if you have questions about that, you can also just send off um, whatever's on your mind, whatever's not clear to me, and I'll make sure that you get taken care of. Right? So um, in the panel um, on your, hopefully it's on your screen, but in the webinar panel, you should be able to see a question section. And that's where you will be able to type in whatever questions um, or comments that you have. Okay, so make sure you look there in that question section, and if you would right now, just you know, as a practice, um, you can type in maybe the school that you're attending now or the school that you did attend, and that way you get a little bit of practice in there um, of how the question panel works. Okay, great. So while you're doing that, I'm going to introduce our speaker now that's going to talk with you about the various certifications available to you as accounting students. We have with us today Dr. Andrew Fellow from the H. Wayne Huizinga School of Business and Entrepreneurship at Nova Southeastern University. 
at Nova Southeastern, he teaches a variety of courses in, in managerial and financial accounting and controllership. And before joining Nova Southeastern, um, which he joined in 2011, he was on the faculty of Penn State University Great Valley School of Graduate Professional Studies. So Dr. Fellow earned his PhD from the State University of New York at Binghamton, and his areas of research include audit committees, gov co corporate governance, business and accounting ethics, and disclosure transparency. He's also, of course, published quite a bit of articles in corporate ownership, control, international um, journal, journal of disclosure and governments, and in other uh, resources and entities. He's also authored some book chapters on different topics. And I thought, found it particularly interesting that he was a recipient of the 2003 Libran Silver Medal for the article on Sarbanes-Oxley Act that was published in the February issue of Strategic Finance. Um, I find that quite impressive. Um, he has facilitated CMA review courses for over 10 years. So when we're looking at an expert on um, CMA certification, I think we have one <laughs> right here. And, and also, he's a certified fraud examiner, certified management accountant, and a certified financial manager. And also, very interestingly and quite impressive, he was the recipient of the IMA's Robert Byer Gold Medal for the highest score on the winter 2001 CMA exam. I mean, again, wow. Um, so, Dr. Fellow, you know, thank you for being here with us. I know that we're in for, you know, quite an interesting uh, time with you and, and I'm really interested to hear what you have to say. And with that, I'll, I will hand it over to you. Dr. Fellow, are you there? Yes, I am. I'm sorry. There looked like there's a little bit of static on the line. Sorry about that. Okay. And yes, uh, thank you very much, Deanna, for for that very nice introduction. Hope, hopefully, I can live up to the uh, live up to those nice accolades. Uh, let me just uh, get started here with our presentation. And let me just give you a little, little bit about me. I, as uh, Deanna said, I've been at uh, Nova Southeastern for the last four years. I spent ten years at uh, one of the Penn State campuses, and for my first job out of school. I was at uh, Millsaps College, a small liberal arts college in Jackson, Mississippi. And prior to uh, uh, entering academia, I worked uh, in a variety of, uh, of, of uh, organizations, primarily in the retail and in the manufacturing sectors. So that's that's where I come from. That's why the certified management accountant is a is a big part of what uh, what I've what I've done in my career. Before we get started into the information, what I'd like to do is just give you a, 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 an overview of our agenda. We're going to do a, a very, very brief polling question just to get a feel about uh, what level of school school you all are in. Uh, we'll talk about the importance of certifications, why this is such a, an important topic for folks. But then we'll get into uh, six certifications, certified public accountant. We'll talk about the certified management accountant, uh, the certified internal auditor program, the certified fraud examiner program, the enrolled agent program, and then lastly, the certified government financial manager program. Okay, and then we'll wrap things up with a, a question and answer session. Okay, so before we get started uh, into the information, a, a very brief polling question. Uh, what is your current class in school? I believe that should be popping up uh, for you to uh, enter your answers. Are you a freshman or sophomore, junior, senior, uh, master's level, or some other level if you're a, a graduate, for example? Okay, again, this is just to sort of lay the foundation for, uh, to let us know uh, what, uh, what, what the audience uh, profile is, okay? And then before, or I'm sorry, uh, 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 after that, let me just move on to my next slide here. So why are certifications so important? Okay, why are certifications important? Well, first of all, a lot of positions require them. Okay, if you're looking for a job, a lot of times they'll say you have to have a CPA, okay, or you have to have a CMA, or you have to have a certified fraud examiner certification. So to get a job, okay, you, you de in a lot of cases you absolutely have to have one, okay, uh, and also to keep your jobs in, in a number of situations. But uh, beyond that, uh, certifications demonstrate that you have mastered a certain body of knowledge, okay, that you understand the, the factors around uh, being an internal auditor, or you understand the tax code uh, to, the situ to, the, to the position where you can be an, an, um, an enrolled agent. So it demonstrates that you've mastered knowledge, okay, that you also have uh, a minimum level of experience, as we'll go through these six 
certifications, they all require some level of experience, okay? Uh, so those two things combined, the, uh, uh, the mastery of the knowledge and then also the level of experience shows that you know what you're doing beyond uh, uh, other professionals, okay? And also, too, it demonstrates a commitment to high professional and ethical standards because as we'll talk, uh, once you become certified, that doesn't, that doesn't stop the journey. You have to maintain those certifications, and the way you do that is through uh, continuing education courses and following a certain code of ethics, those sorts of things, okay? Uh, and also, too, joining um, one of these organizations that, that sponsors a certification can also uh, uh, help you network, okay? So, you, uh, for example, the, the Institute of Management Accountants, they, they, they uh, administer the Certified Management Accountant, okay? Their chapters have monthly meetings where you can go to meet people. Okay, uh, who are who are looking to hire folks? So there's a lot of networking that goes on through the certification process. Okay, uh, then again, you also you can you have the ability to continue learning through those professional organizations, and not only that, but also demonstrating your leadership. Okay, that you can show that, for example, you're on the the, the board of directors of your local uh, certified uh, internal auditor chapter, something like that. Okay, so not only does that help you to maintain your knowledge, but also to de demonstrate leadership, which can then help you in your jobs. And then last but not least, it just gives your family just a, one more reason to brag about you if you can get uh, earn one of these certifications. Okay, so they're, they're important for a variety of factors. Okay, so just as an opening thought, before today, what accounting certifications had you heard of? Now, this is, there's no way to answer this. I just want you to think about it. Okay, I'm sure most, if not all of you, have heard of the, the CPA before. Okay, maybe you had heard about the Certified Management Accountant. Okay, uh, but how about the Certified Internal Auditor, right? When I think of CIA, I don't think of internal auditors. I think of uh, spying, okay? Uh, but that's an important certification. The CFE, the Certified Fraud Examiner, that's an important one, okay? Uh, and then also we have the EA, that's the Enrolled Agent. And then lastly, the Certified Government Financial Manager. So my point here is that there's a lot of certifications beyond the ones that you're probably familiar with, okay? Um, and that you don't just have to be pigeonholed into one particular type of certification program, okay? So there's a lot of different things depending on what your goals are uh, as a professional, okay? So let's start off with the Certified Public Accountant. Uh, obviously, this is gonna be the most widely known of all the certifications, okay? Virtually everybody knows what, uh, uh, what the CPA stands for, okay? And what, what does a CPA do? Well, I've got a quote here from N uh, the NASBA, that stands for the National Association of state board, states boards of accountancy, okay? So what are CPAs? Well, CPAs are typically multi-talented professionals who perform a mix of highly specialized job functions including auditing, business and management consulting, information technology, international financial reporting, and tax advisory services to name a few. Almost every business encounters a financial situation at some point or another where it could benefit from the services of a CPA, okay? So as I said, I'm sure most of you have heard of the CPA certification, okay, but what are the requirements to become a CPA? Okay, well, that's actually a difficult question to answer, all right, because if the specific requirements vary from state to state, okay? Your state, there's a, each state has a board of accountancy, and that board determines what the requirements are. That NASBA that I referred to before is basically the trade association of all the state boards of accountancy together, okay? Um, so how do you find out what, what are the requirements for your specific state? Well, the, the NASBA website is an excellent source of information, okay? And by the way, one of my uh, slides near the end of the, of the slide deck has a list of all these uh, useful websites, okay, that, uh, uh, that, that'll be very, very useful to you as, as you move forward, okay? But gen generally speaking, okay, um, you have to have a certain number of college credits, you have to pass the uniform CPA exam, and have a minimum level of work experience. Sometimes these are referred to as the three E's, okay? E as in uh, as education, E as in exam, and E as in experience, okay? And that's gonna be similar for all of these certifications. There's some level of education, some level of, of experience, and passing uh, an exam, okay? Um, and then uh, some states also require you to pass an ethics exam, okay? Either to become certified or to maintain your uh, certification. Okay, and then lastly, uh, once you keep, or excuse me, once you get your license, uh, you don't just automatically get to keep it. You're going to have to have what's called CPE, Continuing Professional Education. That's what I was referring to before as far as what, uh, uh, what becoming a professional uh, in an organization can, can give you. 
is that, that access to the continuing education. Okay, so again, I can't talk specifically about what each of what, what your individual states will require. Okay, but generally speaking, this is what you'll have to do in order to become a CPA. Okay, and let me just mention uh, briefly about the CPA exam. It's called the Uniform CPA exam because it's the same exam across all 50 states. Okay, even though each state has its own licensing requirements, everybody takes the same basic CPA exam. Okay, it's a 14-hour Boy, that really sounds long. 14-hour, four-part computer-based exam. Okay, you take the exam at a, a pro metric testing center. There's a website, uh, and you'll see that again for a couple of the other certifications. Okay, you don't now have to take the exam in the state that you plan to practice in. Okay, so in other words, if you live, let's say you live in, or excuse me, you're going to school in Florida. Okay, but you're going to, but you want to practice in Texas, you can take the exam in Florida as long as you meet the requirements of the Texas Board of Accountancy to get your license. So that's a nice thing about this, that you don't ha uh, have to travel to that state that you plan to practice in, right, just to, to sit the exam, uh, to sit for the exam, okay? You can take the parts in any order you want. That's the case with some of the exams. Other exams, you have to go in a specific order, but not for the CPA exam, okay? There are multiple choice questions, which are referred to as uh, testlets, okay, what we call task task-based simulations and also uh, basically our essay questions and then also some written communication tasks. Okay? Uh, every candidate actually receives a different set of questions. So you could be taking the exam uh, sitting right next to somebody else who's taking the, the same part of the exam and you will each have a different set of questions. Now the questions are balanced so that each, each uh, actual exam is of equal difficulty, okay? but there are uh, a, a different set of questions. And it's important also to remember from a planning standpoint, you cannot take the exam uh, anytime you want, all right? Uh, you, you, you cannot take it in March, June, September, or December. So basically the, the, the last month of every quarter of the year. There's, a, there's a, a, the, uh, a blackout, so to speak, of the exam, okay? You'll see that with some of the other exams as well. And just to give you uh, an overview of the different parts of the exam, we've got auditing and attestation, four hours, all right? It has uh, 90 multiple choice questions seven task-based simulations. They don't do any written tasks. The only part that has written tasks is over the, all, all the way over there on the right, the business environment and concepts. Okay. Uh, in 2014, the overall pass rate was 46.35%. Okay. So a little less than 50%. Financial accounting and reporting, also four hours, has the same 90 multiple choice questions and the same seven task-based simulations. It had a, a pass rate of a tick higher, 47.6%. Uh, regulation, that's only three hours, uh, 72 multiple choice questions and six simulations. That uh, uh, pass rate was roughly 49.4%, uh, nearly 50%. And then finally, the business environment and concept, uh, again, three hours, 72 multiple choice questions. Uh, no task-based simulations, but there's writing. That's the one part of the CPA exam where writing is tested is on the business environment and concepts, and that had a pass rate in 2014 of about 55, almost 55.5 percent, okay? Uh, so you see that, uh, that, that right around 50 percent for each of the four parts of the exam, okay? But that is the CPA exam, and again, I would suspect that most, if not all of you, ha were pretty familiar with this uh, before, we, uh, before we started here today. So let's move on then to the Certified Management Accountant uh, uh, Certification, okay? Uh, um, it is administered by the Institute of Certified Management Accountants, the ICMA, that is basically an offshoot of the IMA, the Institute of Management Accountants, okay? What, do, uh, what does the Certified Management Accountant Program uh, provide, okay? Uh, the CMA is the globally recognized advanced level credential appropriate for accountants and financial professionals in business. Achieving the CMA demonstrates your professional expertise in financial planning, analysis, control, decision support, and professional ethics, skills that are in demand by organizations around the world. The ba basically here, uh, the idea is, is that it's much broader. It gives you a much um, a wider field than, for example, the CPA uh, certification. Okay, It's not just um, uh, accounting topics. All right? There's a variety of different topics. I'll actually give you the topics for the exam. Uh, uh, in a few moments here, okay, but to become a CMA, it's similar uh, uh, to the three E's that we talked about with the CPA exam. The one nice thing, or one of the nice things about the CMA is that it's the same requirements worldwide. This is a worldwide credential, okay. Um, it's not like the CPA where the, the requirements differ from state to state, okay. Basically, you have to be a member of the IMA, 
okay, uh, have to have a bachelor's degree from an accredited college or university or the equivalent. All right, it doesn't necessarily have to be in accounting, okay, to, in order to, to, to take the exam. It would certainly help, but it doesn't have to be. You have to have two continuous years of experience in either management accounting or financial management, and basically you get signed off on that experience uh, by a supervisor or a number of supervisors, depending on how many jobs uh, you've had. Okay, uh, you enroll in what's called the CMA program. That's basically where you uh, become a candidate to take the exam. You pass both parts of the exam. It is a two-part exam. I'll get to that in just a minute. And agree to abide by the statement of ethical professional practice. That's the fourth E. Okay. Uh, I didn't mention that with the CPA because because uh, 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 that is going to vary from state to state what the uh, what the ethics requirement is. Okay. Um, so what is the the CMA exam? As I mentioned before, it is a two-part exam. All right. It is uh, a total of eight hours. So each part is four hours. It is also a computer-based exam. Just, uh, in fact, all of these are going to be computer-based exams. Uh, each part it has 100 multiple choice questions and two essays. Basically, the way this works is you have three hours to complete the 100 multiple choice questions. Um, if it turns out that you do well enough where you have the, the chance to pass, you are then invited to the fourth hour to, to do two essay questions. Okay? If you do poorly on the 100 multiple choice questions, and there's no mathematical way that you could pass, you don't take that fourth hour. So basically, you want to be there uh, for the fourth hour. Just like the CPA exam, you take it at a ProMetric testing center, and there's the website. And, 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 and for all these exams, there's different requirements for what you have to do in terms of um, uh, registering for the exam and, and, and those sorts of things. So you would want to consult the individual centers. And these centers, by the way, are located all over the place. No matter what state you're in, you'll be able to find a ProMetric testing center. Okay, you can take the exam in, in, in uh, any order. All right, you do part one first or part one second. It's totally up to you. Okay, um, there is one one thing I want to mention that uh, uh, once you enroll in the CMA program, you have to take at least one part of the exam within the first 12 months. Okay, and you have to pass both parts of the exam within three years of entering the program. Okay, so it's not it's not an extended period of time or an unlimited amount of time that you have to pass all parts of the exam. And that's going to be the same way with the CPA exam. It just differs from state to state. Okay. Um, now, what are you covering on the exam? Well, part one is what is called financial reporting, planning, performance, and control. So you do external financial reporting decisions. That's a lot of gap, basically. Okay. And you're going to do planning, budgeting, and forecasting. Okay. That's an important thing of what a management accountant does. Uh, performance management, so things like uh, variance analysis, calculating profitability, those sorts of things. Uh, cost management, in including uh, 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 allocation of overhead, those sorts of things. And then the last part is internal controls. Okay, uh, That's going to be part one of the exam. Uh, part two is what's called financial decision making. Okay, So you're going to do financial statement analysis. You'll have corporate finance, so things like time value of money, those sorts of things. Uh, decision analysis, that would be things like cost, volume, profit, variable cost, break-even analysis, that sort of thing. Uh, various measures, of, excuse me, various ways to manage risk, okay. Uh, investment decisions, so doing things like net present value, uh, internal rate of return, that sort of thing. And then in a, in a um, relatively new thing, professional ethics. It used to be uh, on the CMA exam that uh, ethics was taught, or covered, excuse me, was covered on both parts one and two. Individual ethics was part one. Uh, organizational ethics was part two. Now they've combined it, where all the ethics is on partners in part two of the exam. Okay. Uh, just to give you an idea about uh, uh, costs. Okay. Uh, the program fee. Remember, you have to enroll in the program is two hundred and forty dollars. If you are a student, you get a discount of uh, it's, it's, only, it's only one hundred and eighty dollars. Okay. Uh, each part of the exam is three hundred and ninety-five dollars. You get a discount if you are a student, about 100 bucks off. Okay. Uh, now, there also are windows when you can take the CMA exam. You can take it in January or February, but not March or April, May or June, but not July and August, and then September and October, but not November, December. So you have a little bit smaller window for the CMA exam than you do for the CPA exam. Okay. And just to give you an idea about pass rates, part one. Uh, through October of 14, it was 35% uh, worldwide, but 53% in uh, the Americas. That's uh, 
uh, basically it's North, North and South America. That's how the IMA aggregates that, so 35%. Uh, and then also uh, part two, uh, a, a little bit higher pass rate, 49% worldwide, 57% uh, throughout the Americas. Okay. And then one last thing, as far as being a CMA, you have uh, CPE, Continuing Professional Education Requirements. Okay, you have to do 30 hours uh, uh, over uh, uh, per year. Okay, and let's say you do 38 in one year, you can carry uh, up to 10 over to the next year. So you don't lose all those hours, but it's only uh, up to 10. Um, you have to do at least two hours in ethics every year. And, and also those the two hours can be carried over. And you don't necessarily, you don't actually report what your CPE hours are. It's called random verification. So basically you just keep your records and they, the IMA may call you up and say, okay, we need you to prove uh, that you've, uh, or verify that you've done your CPE, okay? Um, so it's basically, it's an honesty policy, to be honest with you. But they do do random audits and every once in a while, uh, it turns out somebody who claimed to be in compliance uh, was not in compliance, and that obviously is a problem. Uh, not only uh, from a from just from an educational standpoint, but that also violates the IMA's code of ethics because you basically you lied. You said that you did something when clearly you did not. Okay, so that's the CPE, roughly 30 hours, which isn't too much to uh, to try to get on a on a on an annual basis. Okay. Um, now the next certification I want to talk about is a certified internal auditor. Okay. This is, now, now this is a little bit more specialized, okay, um, because now you're getting into a, a, a specific area of, of accounting, the internal audit, okay. Um, it's administered by the Institute of Internal Auditors, the IIA, okay, and, what, and their website is theiia.org, okay. The Certified Internal Auditor designation is the only globally accepted certification for internal auditors and remains the standard by which individuals de demonstrate their competency and professionalism in the internal auditing field. Since the program's launch in 1973, it has opened up countless doors of opportunity for practitioners around the world as it communicates their ability to serve as a key player in their organization's success. So it's been around a long time, since 1973, okay? What do you have to do to become a certified internal auditor? Okay, well, uh, in the United States, you don't have to join the IIA. Some countries you do. Remember, I said it's a global certification. Um, Basically, if you do join, you get a uh, discount on fees, okay? So there's an enticement to join, but you don't actually have to, okay? Uh, you have to have either a three- or four-year post-secondary degree. Uh, like the CMA, it does not have to be in accounting, okay? So it's, so it's much broader than the, the CPA, just like the CMA exam. But also what they've done recently is... Let's say you don't you don't have a three or four year degree. Well, let's say you you only have a, a two year degree, but you have five years of experience. Then you can become an, a, an inter, a certified internal auditor. Or if you have no college, all right, if you have seven years of internal audit experience, you you can become a CIA. Okay, so it's not just limited to folks with a with a college degree. Okay, that's that's unique among these certifications. Okay. Um, you have to have two years of work experience, okay, but if you have a master's degree, then you only have to have one year, okay. Uh, uh, you, have, you also have to provide a, what's called a character reference form. That means you get three people to write letters to attest to your professionalism and your character, okay. Uh, so basically, they're reference letters, all right. Um, you also have to pass all three parts of the CIA exam, and we'll talk about those three parts in a, in a few moments. And all these requirements have to be completed within four years uh, of making your application. So similar to the other certifications, it's not some sort of open-ended uh, 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 time period. Okay, um, it may seem like it's relatively short, but but it, it, you know you have plenty of time to complete complete these requirements. Okay, the CIA exam. Okay, uh, this is also a computer-based exam. It's three parts. It's six and a half hours. Okay. Um, now, uh, it's only going to be multiple choice questions. There's no essays, there's no task-based simulations, nothing like that. So pure multiple choice. You find out if you pass uh, as soon as you, uh, or when you're, when you're done with it, right then and there at the exam site, okay? Here, they, they don't use the Prometric system. They use what's called Pearson VUE Testing Center. There's their website, okay? It's basically the same thing, it's just a different company. It's the same, same process. Okay, you can take the parts in any order. Okay, so uh, you have that level of flexibility. And what's nice, if you're an international student, 
uh, you can take it in a variety of different languages. It's not it's not an English only exam. Okay, uh, there's a whole list of languages uh, on the IIA's website for uh, 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 giving you what what languages the exam is offered in. Okay, uh, so part one is called the the internal audit basics. All right, it's 125 uh, questions over two and a half hours. Okay, uh, I, you know I'm sorry. I think I made a mistake. I misspoke. Um, let me go back here for a moment. I apologize. Uh, I said you have to take, you can take the parts in any order. That was a mistake. You have to take them in a specific order. Okay, you have to take part one first. Okay, because that's the basics of internal auditing. Okay, uh, it's 125 questions, two and a half hours. Okay, so you get the basics of internal auditing. Okay, um, and basically what that consists of is a guidance from the International Professional Practices Framework. That is something that the CIA, or excuse me, the IIA puts out. Uh, basic concepts in terms of internal control and risk. Okay, and then lastly, uh, tools and techniques uh, that you would actually use to conduct uh, an internal audit engagement. So you have to do that part first. All right, you pass that part, then you move on to part two, which covers the practice of internal auditing. Okay, this one is a little bit shorter. It's only 100 questions for two hours. Okay, and you'll see, by the way, that um, you have on, on any of these exams a right around one minute per question, okay, per multiple choice questions. Now, some will take you a little bit longer if there's calculations. Other ones you'll be able to get done fairly quickly if they're conceptual. Okay, so right around a minute, all right, is, is, is what you're looking at. Okay, uh, here, one part of this is managing the internal audit function. Okay, talking about uh, uh, having a risk-based plan for actually doing the audit. Okay, uh, how do you manage individual engagements, planning of that audit, supervision of, of, of staff, communicating the results, and monitoring the outcomes. Okay, and then uh, a, specifically, a, a specific topic as far as fraud, risk, and control. So that's part two. You pass that, and then you move on to part three. That's also 100 hours, excuse me, 100 questions in two hours. Okay, and here's a a real hodgepodge of, of different uh, different topics, okay? Uh, governance and uh, corporate governance and business ethics, uh, risk management, org structure, including business processes and risks. Communication is going to be on there. Leadership, all right? Uh, IT and business continuity, financial management, and the global business environment, okay? So again, part three is really a hodgepodge of things that are re somewhat related to internal audit but don't fit very nicely into either part one, the basics, or part two, the practice of internal auditing, okay? In terms of fees, all right, it's $100 to apply for the program. If you're a member, okay, it's $200 if you're not a member. Remember I said you don't have to be a member, but they give you uh, discounts if you are, okay? And it's $50 if you're a student or professor. If there's any professors on the line, you get a discount, fairly significant discount. It costs $250 to take part one if you're a member. 200 if you're a student or professor. Uh, parts two and three, because they're a little bit shorter, uh, are, are less expensive, $200 each, and $150 uh, if, if you're a student or a professor, okay? Uh, and in terms of CPE, all right, there's a whole wide variety of topics. I'm not gonna read the list, okay? You can read that just as e easily as I can. The, the point is, is that there's a wide variety of topics that um, uh, uh, qualify for CPE credit as an internal audit, a certified internal auditor. That's not necessarily the case with some of the other certifications, okay? If you are an actual practitioner of internal auditing, all right, you have to do 40 hours. If you're non-practicing, which just means you you have the title, but you're not actually out doing audits, okay, uh, internal audits, you would only have to do 20 hours, okay? And a relatively new thing with the CIA program, actually I didn't know this until I started putting these slides together, is the, the IIA has offer, uh, now has, offers what they call specialty certifications, okay? Uh, so for example, if you do not want to complete all three parts of the CIA exam, or for some reason that uh, 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 you don't qualify to sit for the exam, you can get one of these um, specialty certifications, all right? So, and you only take one part, uh, uh, a one part exam, because it relates just specifically to a specific topic, all right? There's a certification, in control uh, self-assessment, there's a certification in risk management, there's a certification in a, as a government auditor, okay, and certification in financial services auditing, okay. So if you don't want to go for the for the traditional CIA certification or something else, maybe you you only limit yourself to one particular 
um, industry or one particular uh, function, then you can this certification one of these certifications could be useful for you. Okay, and there's going to be a lot more information available at the uh, the IIA's website. Okay, so that's that's a, that gives you some flexibility uh, if you want to go into internal auditing. Okay, the next certification that we'll talk about is the Certified Fraud Examiner. Okay, this is administered through the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. Okay, and their website is acfe.com. Okay, not .org, .com. All right, the Certified Fraud Examiner credentials denotes proven expertise in fraud prevention, detection, and deterrence. CFEs are trained to identify the warning signs and red flags that indicate evidence of fraud and fraud risk. CFEs have a unique set of skills that are not found in any other career field or discipline. I'll actually talk about that on the next slide. They combine knowledge of complex financial transactions with an understanding of methods, law, and how to resolve allegations of fraud. So it's a very, very broad-based um, certification. Okay, so what do you have to do to become a CFE? Well, you, you have to be an associate member of the, of the ACFE. That's what you, when you join the ACFE and you're not certified, you are what's called an associate member. All right, they also have student memberships that you can that also qualify you for. You have to have uh, uh, a person be a person of high moral characters, and you have to get three recommendations. Okay, uh, so very similar to what we talked about with the CIA. Okay, um, generally speaking, they're going to have a minimum of a bachelor's degree from an institution of higher learning. Okay, or or for the equivalent, if you're if you're not in the United States, no specific field of study is required. Okay. Um, and if you do not have a bachelor's degree, you can substitute two years of fraud-related experience for each year of study. Okay, so it's very similar to what we talked about with the CIA, where if you don't have a bachelor's degree, that's okay. You, if you have professional experience in internal auditing, that will substitute. Okay, uh, regardless of what your education is, okay, you have to have two years of fraud-related professional experience. Okay, and then also you have to pass the CFE exam within two years of your application's approval. So what you do with the CIA, excuse me, the CFE, is you apply to the program, okay, you get all, all that information taken care of, and then you take the exam. And you have to complete that. Once you get the approval, you have two years to complete the exam. The CFE program is um, unique among, these, uh, among all these certifications, okay? Um, the exam is four parts, and there's a total of 500 multiple choice questions, okay? Uh, including true and false. All right, so there's your, your what I'll call your traditional multiple choice. You know, choose A, B, C, or D, and then there's some some true false questions. Okay, the four parts are fraud prevention and deterrence, financial transactions and fraud schemes, investigation and law. So it's a very very wide open field. Okay, um, you get 2.6 hours for each part. Okay, and you have a maximum of 75 seconds per question. So if you, you can't you can't uh, 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 continue on a question after 75 questions, you, excuse me, after 75 seconds, you automatically are moved on to the next question. Okay. But what's nice about this is you actually download the exam or take it online, and you take it whenever you like, basically. Okay. It's on your schedule. You don't go to Prometrics. You don't go to Pearson VUE. You can take it at your home. Okay. Um, and you have to do all four parts within 30 days. That's one of the of the difficult aspects of it. So you, you prepare, and then and I'll talk about the preparation on the next slide, and then you do all four parts within 30 days. Okay, you have to do all four parts within 30 days. And then what you do is you send your results to the CFE, uh, to the ACFE, and they grade it for you. Okay, um, and so, and, and, and as part of that, because you're taking it on your own at home, you, you basically have to certify that you didn't cheat, okay, that you were the one who took the exam, okay, uh, th those sorts of things. And it's three hundred and fifty dollars to take the exam, uh, or it's two fifty if you uh, purchase the ACFE's uh, preparation course, which I'll talk about here on the next slide. So this is, as I said, this is a somewhat unique exam where you you take it uh, on your own schedule. Okay, so there's a couple different ways that you uh, that you can prepare for. It, all right, actually three ways. Number one, you can just study on your own. Okay, uh, or what you could do. Is you could take a uh, ACFE offers throughout the throughout the year throughout the country um, uh, four day in person exam preparation course. Okay, basically each day is a different part of the exam. Okay, now what I did when I took the course was I purchased what's called the electronic preparation course. Okay, um, and when I took it because it was I'm I'm older so I took it a, a while back it was just 
uh, an, a, a CD. Okay, but now you can get it online. You can get it as you can just download it, or you can still get the CD. Okay, what it is? It's 1,500 multiple choice questions. Okay, and a number of sample exams for each part. Okay, and what you do is then you complete these questions on your own. Okay, this is uh, uh, $745 or 350 if you're a student, so it's a significant discount if you're a student. Okay, and so you do these. What I did was I did these 1,500 questions over a, a, a period of, a, of several months. Okay, and, and the nice thing about this is is the ACFE says to you, if you complete all 1,500 questions and get at least an 85% on four practice exams, if you don't pass, you can either get a refund or a free retake of the exam. Okay, so it's a it's a pretty solid guarantee. And the nice thing about this is you say, my goodness, 1,500 multiple choice questions. But uh, to be honest with you, a lot of those same questions show up, show up on the exam. Okay, so it's actually a pretty good way uh, to prepare for the exam. All right. Um, and then as far as, so you pass those four parts, you get your uh, 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 certification. Okay, then you have your CPE requirements. Okay, this is 20 hours every 12 months. Okay, so your 12-month window depends on when you got your license. So it's a lot shorter, excuse me, a lot fewer credits. Okay, for example, the CIA was 40, the, the uh, CMA was 30. This is only 20 hours. Uh, 10, uh, you can carry 10 hours over from one period to the next, okay, if you were particularly busy one particular year. <clears throat> Out of those 20, at least 10 have to be directly related to fraud, okay. The other 10 can be uh, uh, non-fraud but still related to accounting or finance. And you also have to have two hours uh, with, uh, with ethics training. So you notice here you've got all these um, certifications at some level require some amount of ethics training, okay, uh, to, be, uh, uh, to become uh, initially certified and then also to, uh, to maintain that certification. Okay, my next certification is a very, very specific one, okay, the enrolled agent, okay, this is if you're going to go into taxes, if you're going to be a tax person, this would be a very, very good certification for you. It's administered by the IRS, so it's uh, www.irs.gov, okay, uh, and there's also a trade group called the National Association of Enrolled Agents, that's what NAEA stands for, okay. Uh, an enrolled agent is a federally authorized tax practitioner who has technical expertise in the field of taxation and who is empowered by the United States Department of the Treasury to represent taxpayers before all administrative levels, examination, collection, and appeals of the Internal Revenue Service. In addition to taxpayer representation, enrolled agents offer, uh, often provide tax consultation services and prepare a wide range of federal and state tax returns. Okay, so this is a very, very specific uh, uh, certification. Where if, if you're going to be a tax person, like I said, this is going to be a very good certification for you to, uh, to pursue. And there's two actually ways you can become an enrolled agent. Okay, if you work for the IRS where, uh, for at least five years where you are in position to interpret the tax code, you can become an enrolled agent automatically, no exam, no nothing. You just basically fill out the paperwork. On the other hand, if you, are, if you do not have that level of experience, okay, there is a three-part exam. It's called the, the Special Enrollment Exam. Okay, and then you are subject to a background check. And interestingly enough, there's absolutely no specific background, educational background required. Okay, uh, you could you could major in anything and be an enrolled agent as long as you understand the tax code. Okay, either by working for the IRS or by passing the exam, you can become an enrolled agent. Okay, um, and this exam is given at Prometrics, similar to the CPA and CMA exam. Okay. Part one of the exam covers individual taxation. Part two covers business taxation. And part three uh, deals with representation, practices, and procedures. Okay, there are uh, all, it's all multiple choice questions. There's 100 ex uh, exam questions that are graded, and then there's going to be some extra ones that are experimental. Okay, I didn't mention this before, but for example, with the C CPA exam, I said that there was 90 multiple choice questions on the financial part. Not all of those are going to be graded. Okay, and on the CMA exam, uh, uh, there's 100 multiple choice questions. Not all of those are going to be graded. Now, you don't know which ones are experimental, okay, uh, but some of them are. So, so with, this, with the SEE exam, there's 100 that are going to be graded plus some other experimental ones. And again, you don't know which ones are the experimental ones, okay. A little bit more information about this exam. It's offered from May 1st through February 28th. 
You can probably gather why it's not offered much in March or April, since this is a tax thing. Okay, uh, so you cannot. So, so the so the exam window starts in May and goes through the subsequent February. Okay, you can take each part uh, up to four times in one year. Okay, if you, you want to just keep plugging away, if for some reason you're having trouble passing one, you can take it up to four times in a year. Once you pass uh, a part, you can you have two years to pass the other parts. Okay, you can take the parts in any order. All right, you don't have to take them one, two, three. Uh, the only exam that specifies the order is the CIA exam. Okay, of the ones that we're talking about here today, each part costs $109. All right, and the NAEA, the National Association of Enrolled Agents, offers some uh, online preparation courses and also some in-person preparation courses if you if you want to do that. Okay, um, <clears throat> as far as the CPE. All right, this is uh, the IRS requires you to do 72 hours uh, every three years, okay, uh, with a minimum of 16 per year. So you can't, you know, do nothing for the first two years and then cram 72 CPE hours into one into year three. You have to do at least 16 a year and then a total of 72 over the three years. And also at least two hours per year have to be uh, in ethics. If you choose to be a member of the NAEA, you don't have to be. You have to do uh, uh, 30 hours per year, so a total of 90. So the IRS requires 72. The NAEA requires 30. Okay, uh, uh, th excuse me, 90 over the three-year period. So the NAEA has a little bit higher threshold. You don't have to be a member of the NAEA, NAEA to be an enrolled agent, but there are the benefits, the, the professional education, the networking, so on. Okay. Now my last certification, okay, is one that I had never heard of before I had done this presentation. I had heard of all these other ones, but I had never heard of the Certified Government Financial Manager, okay. Um, so I learned something doing uh, uh, doing this presentation. And what this is, is this is something that's administered by the Association of Government Accountants, okay, uh, and they have a website, agacgfm.org. Right, that's quite a mouthful. Uh, CGFMs work in the federal, state, and local government sectors. They understand the laws and special government financial needs. Many CGFMs are responsible for advising, preparing taxes, helping with budgets, and balancing financial statements for government spending and taxes collected. Acquiring this certification designates you as a leader in your field and someone who understands the unique financial needs of the government on all levels. Okay, so if you think that you want to go into uh, uh, government accounting, this is the perfect certification for you, okay? Because uh, it, it covers exactly what you would need, okay? So to become a CGFM, you don't have to be a member of the AGA, but again, you get a lower cost if you do, okay? You have you uh, pay eighty-five dollars to apply to the particular program. You agree to abide by the AGA's code of ethics. Again, there's that that ethics requirement, okay? You have to have a bachelor's degree from an accredited college or university pass a three-part exam, okay, and then lastly, have at least two years of professional level experience in government financial management, okay. So uh, again, we've got the similar types of, of requirements in terms of education, experience, uh, and an exam, okay. So what is the CGFM exam? Uh, each part is 115 multiple choice questions, so there's three parts, okay. Each part, you have two hours and 15 minutes, okay. So you have 135 minutes to do 115 multiple choice questions, okay. Part one is the governmental environment. Part two is government accounting, financial reporting, and budgeting, okay. Uh, and then part three is government financial, financial management and control, okay. And this exam is also given at the Pearson VUE Testing Center. Okay, much like the CIA exam is given at uh, Pearson. Okay, and you can take all three of these parts in any order you want. Right? They just actually had a price increase uh, as of uh, yesterday. It went up to $125. You can take this year round. There are absolutely no blackout periods. All right, you can take them in any order, as I mentioned. All right, if you ha if you do happen to fail a part, which hopefully you won't, but in case you do. Um, you have to take 30. You have to wait 30 days to retake it, okay? And you have to have all. Uh, you, uh, you have three years from the date your application is approved to pass all three parts, okay? And then lastly, to maintain that CGFM certification, you have to pay an annual fee. All right, this is where you get.
the benefit of being an AGA member. You only have to pay 30 bucks if you're an AGA member, 65 if you're a non-member. Okay, complete at least 80 hours of CPE every two years in appropriate uh, government financial management topics. Okay, uh, whoops, sorry about that. Uh, maintain and if requested by AGA, provide detailed information on your CPE hours. That's just like the voluntary compliance that I talked about earlier. All, right? All these organizations have the same type of compliance. Okay, and also agree to abide by the code of ethics. Okay, so as I said, if you plan on being uh, in government accounting, this would be a perfect certification for you. Okay, and then just to wrap up here before we get to our Q&A, I've got uh, some, some useful websites that I think that, that, that'll be helpful for you that I've mentioned here today. Okay, you've got the NASBA, that's the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. They're the CPA folks. The IMA.net, that's the uh, CMA folks, Certified Management Accountant. The IIA is the Certified Internal Auditors. ACFE is the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. NAEA is the National Association of Enrolled Agents. And uh, <clears throat> the IRS is also part of the Enrolled Agent Group. The AGA CGFM, that's the Association of Governmental Accountants. Okay, And then those two testing centers that I mentioned, Prometric and Pearson. Okay, so. Uh, there's the, uh, slightly different rules for each certification about what you have to do to register, but you can get information about where they're where they're located uh, uh, right at or, uh, right at their website. And, and, and as I said, they're located all over the states, so you sh and actually throughout the world, so you shouldn't have a problem finding a particular uh, site for you to take the uh, any one of these exams. Okay, so with that, let me stop and see if uh, what kind of questions we have that have been uh, coming in. Great. Great, Amy. Thanks. That's that's terrific. And we do have a few questions here um, that are, I think, really interesting. And if you still want to uh -huh. post your questions, go ahead and put them in the in the question box. All right. But let's start off with this one question um, where a person asked that, or, or stated that the material tested on the CMA exam seems to be really similar to the material tested on the CPA exam. So what makes them different? And I guess first off, do you agree with that? And, and, and if so, then what makes them different? There are certain certain similarities, of course, because they're both related to accounting, okay? Uh, and this the CMA exam is, um, generally speaking, the topic, there's a lot um, uh, more topics on the CMA on the CMA exam than you'll see on the CP, CPA exam okay so for example the CMA exam will have a lot more in terms of corporate finance okay um, and, and, and management accounting types of issues now there are some there is some management accounting and some corporate finance on the CPA exam but it, there's much there's many more topics on the CMA exam than on the C, uh, CPA exam now having said that all right there also are some things on the CPA exam that are not on the CMA exam. For example, there's not a whole lot of uh, of taxes. Okay, there's a very little bit, um, but not not much in terms of taxes. There's not much in in fact, there's no governmental accounting on the CMA exam. Okay, um, and also auditing is the, the the extent that auditing is tested on the CMA exam is really more from an an, an, um, an internal auditing standpoint. There's very little external auditing on the CMA exam. So yes, there are a lot of similarities, but there are, are also some, some unique factors. Now, and in addition to that, the CMA exam, basically what it, stre what it stresses is um, a basic understanding of a wide variety of topics versus the CPA exam tends to go much deeper into any one individual pro uh, uh, topic. For example, on the CPA exam, you're expected to know all the different uh, gap rules, okay? In terms of you know how do you how do you account for a lease? How do you do pension accounting? Uh, you know all those sorts of things, okay? Like you covered in intermediate accounting one, intermediate accounting two, okay? And also uh, advanced accounting. At the CMA exam, it's not going to be that level, okay? They're not going to talk about specific um, uh, 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 accounting rules. They'll talk very broadly about. Um, what it means to recognize revenue, what, what it means to have the matching principle, and those sorts of things. But it's at a much, it's at a much more um, basic level on the CM, CMA exam. Okay, uh, I hope that answered that. But uh, and if not, just you know, send us back another comment, and I'll try to try to give you some more details. Yeah. Okay. And and then 
an interesting question. Again, kind of comparing CPA and CMA. Um, who makes more money, CPA or CMA? Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough question because I would say, well, see, because they, uh, uh, they're different. They're different groups of people, and what I mean by that is that they're different industries and and and, and those sorts of things. Um, I would say, and now I don't I don't know this for a fact, but my hunch is that you probably would make uh, CP, CPA certified public accountants probably make more money. And the reason I say that is because um, if you're going to be in public accounting, okay, and, and you're going to be at the top levels of public accounting, you're going to be a CPA, okay, and and their salaries tend to be tend to be fairly high. Um, and and with the CMA exam, um, C, excuse me, the, the CMA certification, um, you're there's not a requirement that if you're, let's say, the CFO of a company, that you're going to be, a, you have to be a CMA. You might be. You might also have a CPA license. So um, there's the, the 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 top the top jobs in public accounting require you to be a CPA, whereas the top jobs in more corporate accounting, which is where CMAs go, uh, don't necessarily require that certification. What I will say is this: that for sure. You definitely will get a, an increase. In, you will have an, uh, a higher salary if you have either one of those than if you don't have any sort of certification. In fact, you will have a higher salary if you have any one of these six certifications that I talked about today versus not having a certification at all. That is one thing that I'm very, very comfortable saying, that you will have a higher salary with any of these certifications. And the, So the question is, well, what would be the appropriate certification? It, it depends really on what you want to do. Okay. Um, if you want to be in, if you want to be in public accounting and be an auditor, okay. Uh, well, then certainly a CPA is what you want to do. Okay. No, really, no questions asked. That will open the most doors for you. Okay. As a CPA. But then beyond that, once you once once you're in public accounting for a, for a couple of years, and, and, and then if you decide, well, I don't want to be in public accounting anymore, that CPA license is still useful to you. But then you might want to add on if you're going to corporate accounting, you might add on the CMA. Or if you go into internal auditing, you might become a, a certified internal auditor or something like that. So the CPA probably, not probably, it does open more doors for you at the start of your career. It's, it's later on when these other certifications might become more relevant for you. Okay, that, that's really good. And you know what? Your answer actually covered a, a several other questions that were around which is the best certification, what do you recommend and for different career paths. So I hope those of you um, heard, the, you know, the full comments on that because I think that, you know, the answer to, about uh, certification for corporate accounting and which is most useful and it, and it does it depend perhaps on career path. Um, mm -hmm. All right, so terrific. Um, <clears throat> we also had a question though um, on of the certifications that you have received, which was the most difficult? The most difficult one was probably, I would say, the, the CFE, the Certified Fraud Examiner, was probably the most difficult. And I'll tell you why. Because at the time I was uh, uh, studying for the CFE exam, I was married. I had one child. Actually, I had two, my, my second child was, was just born. So when I got the CMA and the CFM certifications, I was single. So it was a lot easier for me to um, to prepare as uh, being single. Okay. So I don't know if it was that the CFE material was harder. It's just that I had more things going on in my life that um, made it a little bit more difficult. But the, uh, uh, so you know, I'm not, I'm not quite sure if that was the uh, you know the kind of answer you were looking for. I will say this: I, I did pass the CPA exam as well. Uh, the reason I don't have a CPA license is I never got the work experience. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I took the exam out of school, or while, actually while I was a senior in school, and then I passed it uh, the next time around. And my career path never got me to a place where I was, um, uh, where I got the work experience. And then I, I never went into that area of accounting, so I didn't really worry about that. Um, but, but I will say, out of out of all those exams, the CPA exam was definitely the hardest. Okay, um, I passed it, but uh, but I don't have the work experience. That's why I don't have that particular certification. Don't and, and and I will say this: don't go after a certification because you think it's an easy exam, because none of these exams are easy. 
Okay, they're, they're, none of them are easy. I mean, you saw um, the pass rates. Now, the, the other organizations, the CFE, the uh, CIA, the enrolled agent, and the CGFM, they didn't publish what their pass rates were. So that's why I didn't have any information up on their pass rates. I suspect they're probably not much higher than the, you know, the roughly 40 to 50 percent that I published or showed you for the uh, CPA and CMA exams. But none of them are easy. Okay, so we're at the top of the hour. I'm going to ask one more question because it kind of relates to what you just said. And, and it, you guys have sent some really good questions. We have not gotten to them all, and, and I apologize for that. But as mentioned, we will get you answers back on the ones we didn't get to. So, so just knowing that this is our last one right now in respect to time, you mentioned experience in attaining your CPA, and we had a couple of questions around getting that experience that, you know, well, one was, how do you meet the work experience? And um, and I, I think would be leading it, does it have to be a public accounting job? And then ha is there a time frame um, that you have to get that experience in, in order to get the CPA license? The CPA requirements are going to be different from state to state, where, uh, where, where, like how long you have, like how much experience you would need, and how long you have to get that experience. Um, so I can't comment specifically on that, but what I will say is you don't necessarily have to have public account, you don't have to be working in public accounting to become a CPA. And, and so for example, if, let's say you're working um, if for, a, for a corporation, okay, um, in, their, in their accounting area as a financial analyst or something like that, and you have your boss is a CPA, okay, your boss can sign off and say what you are doing is similar work to what a CPA would do, and therefore that would cover the work experience. So it doesn't have to be where you're being on an audit or doing tax work to qualify. Okay, as long as you get a CPA who says yes, what they are doing is similar to what a CPA would it does, then that would qualify. All right, but as far as the exact amount you would need um, for, uh, is, is is going to vary from from state to state. All right, typically it's two years. And then you, if you have a master's degree, uh, you may only have to do one year. But that, I, I, don't, I don't want to state that unequivocally because I'm, I, I, I'm fairly certain that that uh, differs from state to state. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to close the call uh, just because we've passed, passed our limit. But I want to thank you so much. Um, this was you know, great information. And thank you all for attending. Um, and thanks for the excellent questions. We'll get back with you on that. And other than that, I hope you all have a, a great afternoon. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Deanna? I'm here. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I was just making sure I got all these questions oh, okay. um, before I close it. it, it they oh, okay, okay. It usually records uh, the questions. Um, okay. But, yes, I, I was just doing that.